Okay, everybody, we are live. I'm going to give it a couple seconds for the notifications to go out. Hopefully, everybody got one. I still haven't had one pop up on my phone yet, though. Me neither. Hey, everyone, um, by the I way. I just did now, so more people should be rolling in soon. Hello, everybody that's in the chat. Thank you for being here already. Um, Kim and I have Scott Schwartz with us today. Um, I'm sure as everybody knows that he was in films such as The Christmas Story, The Toy, and the what was the one with Corey Haim, Scott? The line? A Time to Live. Oh, A, A Time, Time to, to Live. Live. Okay. Yeah. Um, so he was really good friends, best buds with Corey Haim, and uh, he grew up in the industry at the same time that Haim was in the industry. And, you know, Feldman was around that time, too, so he knows a lot of things. He witnessed a lot of things, and he's here today to talk to us about it. Mm -hmm. and, welcome, and just so we you. can just, You're very welcome, and just so that everybody knows, there's no donation involved. You don't have to pay 20 bucks. This is not a money grab. This is how it's supposed to be done. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You don't have to, you know, charge people to hear the truth. Yeah. Absolutely not. He probably would get a lot further if he would have just taken donations for it and more people would have seen it if he just said, hey, there's a minimum donation of five bucks or something like that. But, you know, you got something to say and it's this particular topic. You don't do that. You call a press conference, TMZ, the, the other trades, the, the CNNs, whoever you want. You know, I don't care. And you put it out there. You say, this is what's been said. This is what happened. This is how it happened. You have to have facts. You have to have ammunition, as so they say. You can't just speak without, you know, anything, mm -hmm. you know. And, yeah. and yeah. that's yeah. what's really gone on here for just way too long. You know, I'm doing this because it's time to set the record straight. There are people's lives who are being affected who are innocent or they're, they're, you know, being uh, terrorized by other people because of things Mr. Feldman has said. And it's just time. Uh -huh. I agree. Well said. Sorry, hold on one second. Um, <clears throat> Christy, uh, Mary, Shannon, Stacy, can you guys jump over into Bobby's chat real quick so I can have him make a couple mods? Just because I know we're going to have a lot of people right now. We have 76 between the three streams, and it's just going to grow. If so you, you are in Bobby's know. chat or in my channel, uh, come to SusieQ7979 for the main chat. Yeah, I guess at some point when, when people do make comments, I actually get to see them this time. That's very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very interactive. That's one thing I like about it, this forum. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I know there are several people out there that I had already spoken to, told them I was doing this. Uh -huh. So uh, I hope they're here and they're listening. And Me too. Yeah, well, thanks for uh, sharing the stream. So, um, okay, hopefully Bobby gets a test message. He's like, how do I mod somebody? This guy. I can't just not the time for that. Let's, let's I just know. Get... I'm like, whatever it is. Yeah. Whatever. Okay, Mary's in there and she's got a wrench. I okay. think it would be fine anyways. Yeah. We can always delete a whole comments oh. later. There it is. Um, now I got the, the live comments. I didn't have hi. that open before. I had, I had private chat, not live oh, comments. Oh, well, good. That's good. You can see. All right, you're on your computer then, huh? Yes. Tomorrow, I'm tomorrow, not. Tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. I'm on my phone. When you're on so. your phone, you can Christine, thank that. you for the truth for free. You're welcome. Greg Harrison says, so just... So just so people know, when you start to see the real truth and you want to apologize to Judy or Greg, too late, LOL. We we forgive you. Move on. We don't want to talk to you anymore, ever, LOL. Okay. That's hi, Coach. Hi, Christy. Hi, Mike. Hi, Hitman. Hi, everyone. Oh, you're yes. seeing. Do you see any people in blue, Scott? No, I'm seeing the live comments. But there's nobody in blue? No. Okay, so you have Bobby's. Um, that's okay. He can still, okay. we can. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. Fine. No worries. I have what you gave me. Okay. 
Um, well, what do you want to start with telling you want to talk about like we have, well, the first time you met Corey Haim and how it all started? And Well, Cor uh, Corey Haim and I met on the set of A Time to Live, you know. Um, he had already done Lucas. He had already done a few other films. He hadn't done Lost Boys yet. Uh, we were up in Montreal in Canada. And, uh, you know, he's a couple years younger than me. So it was kind of the older brother, younger brother, which is what we played in the show. Liza Minnelli was our mom. Jeff DeMond was the dad. And he played a very sick kid. And it was a great role. And he was terrific in it. Um, but he and I had a blast up there. You know, we became instant friends. And uh, so much so that... Uh, I was 17. He was, okay. he was around 14. Nice. Uh, and we got each other's phone numbers. You know, no cell phones back then. We got each other's house numbers and all that. Uh -huh. And um, I moved to California the beginning of 87. And I guess Haim was already out there. But, you know, we just kind of had to find each other. Okay, fine. Um, and then we both moved into the same apartment building together uh the beginning of 88 so we basically we basically said hey if we both move into the same place we'll get a deal on the rent whatever so i was on the fourth floor and he was in the penthouse apartment right above me with his dad okay you know so i mean we basically saw each other every day right because you know it, it, it was funny we didn't have to use the phone when he wanted to talk to me he would just bang on the floor <laughs> I, I love the old like days building like that we used to take a broomstick <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, would, he would just bang on the floor and i would go upstairs you know a lot of times his door was open it wasn't even locked you know uh -huh, and yeah. uh so we got to spend days. quite a bit of time together you know and uh that's what friends do yeah. you know yeah. you go out for pizza you go bowling you go wherever and you hang out or you go see the other gang yeah Scott Grimes, Brian Bloom, Alyssa, uh, Alyssa Milano. Um, oh, God. Kirk Cameron was around. Uh, and, and you guys all hung out at the Alfie Soda Pop Club, right? Well, that, that comes, you know, I, I actually, I started going before we moved in together, to, or moved in the same place. Uh, I was there maybe a month or two uh, in L.A. and got an invite because I was a former child star, whatever. And I was still young enough. I was, you know, 18 going on 19 uh, to go to the Alfie Soda Pop Clubs. Mm -hmm. Alfie Soda Pop Club was basically a gathering for children in the entertainment industry at that time. Randy Miller, who owned New York Seltzer, was the, was the host of the show. He paid for it. Uh, Alfie Hoffman was strictly uh, the promoter. He was the one because his father was a casting director. So he knew a lot of the moms, the kids, whatever. And they more or less, it became word of mouth. No email back then. Mm -hmm. And everybody went to the Hotel Roosevelt for the parties. Now, what did they consist of? A lot of New York seltzer, uh, you know, fruit baskets, you know, plates and that kind of stuff. Salads, nothing crazy. What did we do? We hung out. We shot the shit, as they say. Um, they had karaoke contests, they had lip syncing contests, you know, uh, they would have people get up on stage and perform and sing and dance and whatever. It was probably the th third or fourth one that I went to when it was Alfie Hoffman, you know, uh, New York Seltzer presents, uh, you know, uh, Alfie Soda Pop Club, uh, and Corey Feldman wish you to come to the thing, you know, to the Alfie Soda Pot Club. Okay. Now, again, what went on there? It was one big ballroom. You know, there was not multiple rooms. There were not side rooms. There were not back rooms. Were there and, men in the black suits standing around? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get to that. Okay. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Now, this was not a place where parents just dropped off their kids. There were okay. photographers there, you know, from the industry. So the kids did get some PR out of it for the teen magazines and all that. Right. And that's really why Randy Miller did it because he was getting advertising for New York Seltzer. Right. You know, all the child stars are having New York Seltzer. You should have it too. Black cherry and grape and this one, whatever. Okay. So there were parents there. You had Alyssa Milano's mom was there. Scott Grimes' mom was there. Uh, sometimes Bob Feldman was there with Corey. Um, and, you know, various other parents, Tracy Gold's mom might have been there, Faustino's mom or dad might have been there, whoever. 
there was always 10, 15 parents at a minimum that were there. Mm-hmm. You can call them chaperones. You can call them just hanging out because they all were friends. So they all shot the shit like the rest of us. Right. Mm-hmm. Now yeah. we get to the infamous, the infamous men in black. Mm. There were guys there in suits and ties, maybe four, five, something around there. What were they doing there? They were off-duty police officers for our security. You got to have security. You got kids on television, kids in films, you know, Uh these are kids making anywhere from 5,000 to 100,000 a week. You got to have security. They were like for a kid's club. Exactly. That's what they did. Now, there was a few times where there were after parties. A couple times we went to a place called Ed DeBevick's. It was kind of a diner, a late night diner. We okay. Had that in Chicago, yeah. And there was a whole bunch of us there. It wasn't like one person went, you know, I'll say Alfie with four kids. No, there were 12 of us, 20 of us, whatever it was. You hang out, you're having a good time for a couple of hours, then you want to get some food. This is a natural thing. You go for food. Okay. There were a couple of parties at Randy Miller's house that I that I went to. I don't think I missed any of them, you know, because he kind of came and he and I got along really well. Okay, fine. Um, but he would, you know, Alfie would tell people, we're going to go to Randy's afterwards, bring a bathing suit, whatever. He had a spa. He had a pool. But there were food and drinks there. Now, when I say drinks, I clarify. There was no alcohol. Okay. You know, right. There was no alcohol at the Soda Pop Club. There was no alcohol at Randy Miller's. That's not what this was. These right. were kids from the ages of probably eight or nine up. And I was the oldest, I pretty much think, at 19, you know, 18, 19. You know, mm-hmm. I think Brad Pitt showed up one time for like 10 minutes, but he was a little bit older and saw it really wasn't his crowd and probably left. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. Um was there any shenanigans going on? Was there anything that anybody saw going on? No. Now, I'm the oldest one there. And I've also been a people watcher my whole life. I'm very observant. Uh-huh. Me too. Nothing, nothing was going on. I don't even remember seeing like kissy face in the corner. Nothing. These were just kids who wanted to hang out with their peers. Right. You know, when you're on a set five days a week, you're on a show, you don't get to hang out with kids. Other than maybe your stand in or if there's another kid on the show, you know, so Mm -hmm. that's what Alfie Soda Pop Club was. Now, at the time, Alfie had a girlfriend. I knew who she was. You know, when when the soda pop party stopped, Alfie had another girlfriend or somebody, whoever it was. But there were women along the way. He had a child with one of them, you know, from Hmm. everything that I have ever seen or know about this particular person. Uh Nothing has ever gone on. Never touched a kid improperly, never did anything improperly. Not even the remote, weird looking anything, you know, and I kind of have to look at it from the perspective of 30 plus years ago. Right. You know, there were people who said, oh, this is really (laughs) weird. It wasn't weird because it was 40, 50, 70 of us hanging out. Uh That's what they were for to get publicity. There was a reason. Alfie was hired to do a job. Uh You know, he wasn't there to become friends with us. I can tell you, I never went out with Alfie other than I saw him at the soda pop clubs, you know, and then the after parties. There was no such thing as him calling me, me calling him, hey, let's go for dinner. Never happened. That's not what his job was. His job was to get the kids there, to get the publicity, and that was it. Right. You know. Uh, we'll go into the claims and all that stuff, you know, as we get further along. When was the first time you met Feldman at that event? Um, No, I met him before. uh, uh, I met him at the Youth and Film Awards in 86, in October of 86, a few months before I moved out to L.A. Okay. You know, um, it's Corey Feldman. It is what it is. You know, he had... Huh. Done other things beside um, Lost Boys, you know, uh, at that time, you know, Gremlins and the other things that he did. Uh, oh, Goonies, of course, you know. Uh-huh. Uh, listen, hell of a nice career. Did a good job, you know. Was always part of ensemble pieces, which was great. 
you know, it worked for him. It worked for the others, you know, on sort of the same way. You've got the toy. It's Richard Pryor, Jackie Gleason, me, Teresa uh-huh. Ganzel, Ned Beatty, everybody else. Okay, fine. Um, you got Christmas Story, which is an ensemble piece. Uh-huh. You know, it's all the kids and the mom, the dad. Okay, fine. Uh, you know, I, one thing I've never done is belittle his career or things that he did, you know, back then. The dream, a little dream and all. Good for him. Right. You know, I'm, I'm not here to say or uh, to miscategorize or, or mis it, disrespect the things that he did. I've right. never done that and I never will. Separating his work from his personality, basically, or what, you know. Pretty much. Yeah. You know, I mean, there was always the Michael Jackson stuff. You know, that was his shtick, you know. The black outfits and the glasses and the hat and the sh- and it was just like whatever, uh-huh. you know. It it was what it was. Uh-huh. You know, you idolize the guy. Okay, there you go. Right. Fair enough. You're nicer than me. <laughs> yeah. Um. When we met Scott, you told me a story about the license to drive thing. Mm-hmm. Do you can you share that story? Um, I mean, more or less, it was just a, a, a thing where, you know, him and I were very, very close and he wanted me to be the third wheel in license to drive. He had already, uh, started experimenting with drugs, talking to the wrong people, listening to the wrong people. And I go up in the apartment one day and there was a stack of scripts. I mean, there was 12, 15 scripts there and everybody wanted him. And he was already the, you know, no, I'm not in the mood. I said, dude. Come on. I grabbed the top script. It was licensed to drive. And I sat there and I said, I'm going to read this. Yeah, whatever. So I see that there's the best friend. And I said, this would be hysterical. Me, you, Feldman, we all get to work together, whatever. And uh, from sort of what I understand, there was a producer's meeting. And for whatever his reason, Feldman didn't want me to be a part of the gang. For whatever his reason. Jealousy. Yeah. Maybe. You know, I mean, it would it would have put two blonde kids and a brunette, and he would have been the brunette. You know, mm-hmm. they ended up hiring uh, actually a kid I went to school with in New York, Michael Manasseri. You know, mm-hmm. who I who I was uh, I was friendly with for many many years. Um, right. You know, didn't take it to heart, didn't take it personal. I'm a forgiving guy. It's like that's what he did. He it's kid stuff. You know, yep. when you're 16 yep. years old and you just yep. do stupid shit. Okay, fine. Yep. You know, there. Yep. Um, and it's not like I didn't talk to him after that. You know, no. we, we all did hang out. There were poker games and everything else that we'll get to down the line here. Um, it it happened. OK, fine. You know, I'll, I'll do what I'm supposed to. I'm going to get the jobs I'm supposed to get. And he's going to get the jobs he's supposed to get. That's just how it goes. Right. Right. So we get to. um the end, end, end of 89, beginning of 90. And uh, there was a lot of tension between the two of them. You know, they weren't hanging out. They had stopped hanging out. I had, I had uh, moved, whatever. And, uh, you know, we had moved out of the apartment place that we were in. So I didn't see Corey all that much for about a year and a half or so. And I had, I had actually moved back east. I went back and then, you know, and then I came back the beginning of right after the beginning of 90. I came back. Oh, yeah. I forget, didn't you and Bobby like have the same baseball coach or something or something like that. I forgot. Actually, your- no. I, 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 let me get the timeline right. I moved back in the in, in beginning of 90 and I came back in the beginning of 92. OK, so late 89, I was still hanging with with them, but there was tension. And by the time I came back in 92, he wasn't even really speaking. Uh, Haim was not speaking to Feldman at all. Right. You know, he just said shit went down, and I really don't want to talk about it. Okay, fine. Wait, and this was 1990. Yeah. Okay. So um, Haim and I hung, did stuff, come over, play Space Ace, go someplace, whatever, Sports Center, bowling alley, whatever. Um, you know, Feldman kind of went with his own crowd you know, and did his own thing. And I never questioned that, you know, we were never close friends. We play poker once a night years later. Okay, fine. You know, for a little while. Um, 
that stopped predominantly because an article was written about him. And I said to him, hey, this is a bad article, man. This basically says I was on drugs. I'm not now. Please hire me. I said, it's like a cry for sympathy, man. Wow. I said, this is a terrible article. Was these posts around um, 2000, 2001? And was it in a People magazine saying mm-hmm. he had been sober? Okay, that's curious. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that was kind of the last that I went to, to poker, you know, with Feldman. Um, but Heyman and I talked, you know, all throughout the years. We, we talked, we went out, we did things, you know, I was there, you know, it was probably, uh, 94, 95, somewhere in there. And Heyman and I were sitting in his apartment and I could tell something was really bothering him. And I'm like, dude, what's up? Now nah, I really don't want to talk about it. Well, you know, when you're friends with a guy already for however many years, over a decade, yeah. Yeah, dude, come on. I'm the older brother here. You know, what's going on? Tell me what's going on. And he told me about what had happened with Dominic. Dominic Braja. He told yep. me what had happened. Mm-hmm. Okay. I hadn't seen Dominic for a little bit. And that was fine with me. Why? Because Dominic hung out with Feldman. They were buddies. I'm uh-huh. sorry. Who did Dominic hang out with? Yeah, Mr. Feldman. Oh, Mr. okay. Corey. Thanks. Let me, let, me, let me say that again. Mr. Corey Feldman. Because if I say Mr. Feldman, it becomes Bob, and that's not it. So you right. hung out with Corey Feldman. Okay. Um, and I just, I, you know, blew my mind. you got to be kidding me. Really? Blah, blah, blah. Have you seen him? No. I said, good. You know, let's hope you never see him again. Right. And of course, he was not hanging out with Feldman. So the chance of him seeing Dominic were less and less. Okay. I actually did run into Dominic later in the conversation we had. I don't need to repeat. I just basically said, you stay away from him, me, and everybody. That was pretty much that. Um, now you, you get to the movie Busted. Uh that Corey Feldman directed. Uh Haim is going to be in the film. Now, apparently there must have been a shortage of heavy, overweight actors at that time in Hollywood, because I guess the only guy that Feldman could hire for this particular role was Dominic Braja. Yeah, convenient. Now, he already knew at this point what had happened. Mm. So why he puts the two of them in the same place at the same time is completely beyond me. Don't know. I know there was a argument. I know that Haim put Feldman up against the wall and really just chewed his ass out for doing this. Uh I wasn't there. I didn't see it, but I heard what happened from, from many different people which I will sort of interject that apparently, you know, I shouldn't even say apparently uh, Mr. Feldman last week that did a live feed and said that in fact, in an alleyway that I was the one that Hayne put up against the wall and said, don't talk about my best friend like this. Yeah, he did. Now you have to understand. And and this, this word's going to come up a lot in this chat. Uh That would be a load of bullshit. (laughs) Uh never happened okay Uh Haim was was pretty transparent and anything that was major in his life that would go on Uh he would tell his other best friend Uh who was his mom yeah I was just going to say never did she hear this before because this is la la land this is imaginary shit or as we say it's bullshit that's yeah. just what that is. Okay. So now we continue. That happens. Okay, fine. Now, you know, whatever. And uh, they're not hanging out. They're not friends. Now, did you see them in public? Absolutely. Uh-huh. Corey Haim was the consummate professional. He understood where his real bread was buttered. If he wanted to, people to see him, when you know that there's an event, the PR person calls the other PR person. You got to get the two Corys together. They're there for their red car, this red carpet, that red carpet, this party, whatever it was. But it wasn't like one guy called the other one and said, hey, dude, I'll be over in 15 minutes to pick you up. Never happened. That's not how it went. 
went to the event, took the pictures, did the PR, stayed for a few minutes to talk to some people, out the door he went. That's what he did. You know, again, that's not friendship. That's business. Yep. That's smart business. Mm -hmm. He put his personal feelings aside and said, this is my job. This is what I do. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. That's that gives you a little more insight to about about Corey Haim as a person. You know, Um, you know, I mean, where do you want me to go from here? I can go anywhere. Wherever you want. I mean, did you ever like. So he told you in 1990, Haim, that he had a falling out with Feldman. It was it was it was it was later than that. It was like 93 ish. Okay. Somewhere in there, because I had already come back from being back east. And then, um, like, when did Haim work with him really again? Was it at the reality show? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure if they did films in between, because you know, that's right. not my job to keep track of his IMDb. Not my yeah. job. Yeah. You know, yeah. I knew he had he done he done a lot of films. He did a lot of films without Feldman. You yeah. know. But his, his big paydays were always with them. They were a team. It's Abin Costello. It's, you know, Jerry Lewis, yep. Dean Martin. I mean, that's where yep. they were. Yeah, you know, they, they were, were a team. Times. Yep. You know. Um, Jay, hold on one second. Jalen, thank you for the $1.99 super chat. And you're officially the first person who has super chatted on that channel. So. I'm not getting any of this. <laughs> just want to make just, sure everybody knows. This is not, this is not my GoFundMe. This is no, not my no, GoFundMe. No, I, I no, 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 no. Donations and it's for some legal funds. So okay. But you, yeah, so you you get to the two Corys. What had happened? Um, you know they were fighting all during that time. Haim was going through a lot of stuff. You know psychologically. You know, um, yeah, and. Uh, you know, again, it wasn't something that I brought up again. You know, there were there was a few times. You know, him and him and mom had a spat, and that happens between parents and their. Okay, sorry. Go uh, ahead, Scott and Kim. It happens yeah. between parents and kids. Uh-huh. They have a, had a spat. You know, well, where would he go? He come to my house, my my place. He come to my apartment. You know, yep. and I cook for him and do whatever. You know, but I'm I'm not a drinker, so there was basically no booze in my house. Uh-huh. I've never been on drugs of any uh-huh. kind. You know, I smoked pot in high school, yeah. you know, a little bit after that, maybe in my early 20s, a couple times, but it wasn't anything that I would go get a bag and roll my own. It never happened. Right. You know, so, you know, if he's coming to my house, he's going to be clean and sober and he's going to get some good food on the table, you know, yeah. which yeah. he got at home, too, because, you know, Judy was a good cook. So there you go. She, is, she still is. Yes. Yeah, unfortunately, she lives too many miles away from me, so I can't go over. She and, lives close to me, and I've been there for dinner, and it was very delicious, okay. except the dessert. <laughs> Sorry, Judy. <laughs> so, I mean, I saw Haim before that, after the show, all that stuff, you know, when there were times in need for different uh-huh. reasons, you know, no problem. They pick up the phone. They call me. You got it. Okay. Um. <sighs> It's not really until Haim is gone that the enormous amounts of bullshit started. You know, let let me say this first. I have never doubted that Feldman had something happen to him. Never. I agree. I never said it didn't happen. You know, this whole thing, somebody passed him a Haim around and shared. That's all nonsense and bullshit. Never happened. But I've never said nobody touched Corey Feldman. Never said that at all. You know, um, the heavy duty stuff really happens when Haim passed away. Uh-huh. So here we go. Yes. Let's get into passes it. Away. He passes away, you know, early in the morning, March 10th. And I got up in the morning. I hear about it. I had something to do that morning. And I went over to uh, their apartment. Uh, probably 1230 ish and Feldman had already been there, you know, or actually no, the first day I got there first. Yeah. I stayed for a little while. Uh, Corey's father hadn't even gotten there yet from Toronto. So I left I'll be back tomorrow. So I come back the next day, which was Friday. And, uh, there's about four or five people in the apartment beside Bernie and Judy and they are hot. 
I mean, they're steaming hot. I'm like, oh, Jesus, what happened? You know, that's going through my head. Ernie pulls me outside to the little patio, and he proceeds to tell me about an hour, hour and 20 minutes before I got there, Corey Feldman showed up and offered the family a quarter of a million dollars to shoot the funeral in Toronto so they can edit it back into season two of Corey Corey. They can get a replay on TV and they can get some royalties from the DVD sales. I did not know that. I've heard this story. What happened? Wow. This is wow. your best friend in the world. Yeah. He hasn't even gone from the coroner's office and left oh. the building. And somebody is already thinking about money. Okay. Wow. Now, I, now again, I get it. They had met a couple of weeks earlier. They were discussing a, something that Haim had actually written, an outline for license to fly. Uh -huh. Kind of like a sequel to License to Drive. Uh -huh. And uh, they were discussing it. And I guess at that point, then they had a, a lunch or a dinner. They met up. They were talking about the script, whatever. And untimely, Haim passes away. So there was money that went into the box with him. Feldman lost a lot of money right there. A lot of right. money. Right. And there was also some talk of another series of some kind, another reality-based series of some kind. That's all gone. What's he going to do? So this is what he came up with. This is what he offered the family. They, of course, were livid. Beyond yeah. livid. They were in yeah. shock. Livid. Yeah. And uh, they told, you know, they told him to get out. And I'm being nicely about what was said. Mm -hmm. So then again, I show up an hour later. Here we go. This is what happened. So Bernie tells me this, and I'm flabbergasted. I can't even believe it. Me neither. You know? I am too. Yeah, um, sorry before. Then Judy started cleaning out Corey's bedroom. She's putting stuff in bags. You know, he's gonna. She's gonna throw out this stuff. She's gonna donate this to Goodwill, whatever. And I said, "Listen, this sounds really bad, but it is what it is. This is the situation at hand." I said, "You don't have enough money to bury this kid." You don't have the money. I said, give me the stuff. I will put it up on eBay. I will sell it for you. I will say it's coming from the Hain family. It's authentic. This was his shirt, his pants, whatever, his keyboard, you know. Right. Judy finds a stack of CDs in the bottom drawer, dresser drawer that Haim had. Mm -hmm. And it was all Feldman CDs that he had given him. Huh. Not, one of, not one of them was open. I don't blame him. I've heard Feldman saying it sucks balls. Holy. Yeah. So, That's hilarious. <laughs> so Judy says to me, the last thing my child would have listened to on planet Earth would be anything that Feldman is singing. Mm -hmm. I said, give them to me. I will, again, do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Maria Menudo showed up. She shot a little thing. You know, she talked to me and I, and, and I wasn't out for myself, I'm trying to raise money for him. Okay. So she put it up on Access Hollywood, the little thing that they did. It helped get sales. It helped get them a nice chunk of money to help bury Corey and have a nice stone. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That night on Larry King, Haim, or Feldman is talking about a whole bunch of stuff about Haim, and they don't know what caused this yet. You know, could there be drugs involved? They didn't know. Uh -huh. And they kind of left it up in the air, you know, let's just see, whatever. But it wasn't debunked. It wasn't proven to be false yet. Right. You know, it takes a while to get the toxicology test. Results. Okay, fine. So now we go to Monday. Or uh -huh. wait, let me stop. I said to Judy and Bernie, hey, listen, tell me when the funeral is. I will be there. And they said it's on Tuesday. I said, okay, I'll take the red eye Sunday night. I'll stay Monday. Okay. Bernie says, listen, I know you love my son. Judy knows you love her son. Corey knows you love him. Why would you do all of that to see a box? Pay your respects, but see a box. Makes no sense. Save your money. My kid never saved his money. This is what I'm this is what Bernie says to me. Save your money. Make a plan, come later. I said, is that what you want? Yes. Okay. Now we get to Monday on Larry King. Yeah. 
Corey Feldman goes on Larry King and they're talking about this and that. And he asks, yeah. uh, uh, Larry King asks him, are you going to the funeral? Uh-huh. The words that were spoken were, no, the family asked me not to go because it would create a media circus. Uh-huh. This, is what the man, this is what the kids said at the time. Now, of course, that's bu- here we go. That's bullshit, too. Yes, thank you. He had just gotten divorced, or Susie had filed for divorce, his, first, his second wife uh-huh. had filed for divorce, and he had no money, uh-huh. not even a credit card to put down. Yeah. So he doesn't go. But he goes on Larry King, and this is what he says. So he can't even tell the truth there. Nope. He leaves Larry King, and him or one of his people, uh-huh. called TMZ, Please show up at the Sunset Tattoo Parlor. I'm going to get a tattoo of Corey Haim, my best friend. Yeah. Is he doing it because it's his best friend? Is he doing it because he's getting the play and sympathy and the TMZ thing? It's publicity. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. If my best friend died, I would don't I wouldn't go that night or it would take me I don't even know how long to be able to talk about it and even get through an interview. Okay. I wouldn't oh. even think to do an interview I'm, if I lost my best friend. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit more forward and back, but you'll see where I'm going. Okay. Uh, six months later, I, I told uh, Bernie and Judy I would be there by September 1st. This is March 12th. In August of that year, I was making my plan, and I picked up the phone, and I called Mr. Feldman, mm-hmm. and I said, hey, have you gone to see Haim yet? He says, no. I said, okay, I'm making the plan. He says, oh, I'm very busy. I said, Corey, you have not gone and seen Haim yet. I'll tell you what, I will pay for your plane ticket. I will pay for the rental car. I will pay for our hotel rooms for one night. We'll take a red eye. We'll go see Judy. We'll go see Corey. We'll have some dinner. We'll get back on a plane and come back, you know, basically a day and a half. Right. And he says, oh, well, you know, yeah, whatever. But, you know, I'm just really busy. Naturally. This, this, is, this is his best friend yeah. in the world. Yeah. And six months later, he hadn't gone yet. Now, of course, it did take him five years, six years to go because he was doing a comic con there. Mm-hmm. So somebody else paid for the plane ticket. Somebody else paid for the hotel room and he's making money. That's when he went and saw Judy. He went and no. saw the grave site, talked Judy into taking a picture with him with the grave site, which Judy didn't want to do, but he kept the emotional thing up and playing on her sympathies. So she took it with him saying, this is just for me. I will not put this on social media. I will not do anything with it. It's just for me. And of course, 48 hours later, he put it on his social media. Yep. So, uh, so he backstabs Judy. Okay. Yeah, repeatedly, yeah. Now we're going to go back for a minute. I'm out in L.A. for about six months. This is like August, mid-August of 87. Okay. I met Feldman already, hanging out, whatever. He calls me up one night. 7.30 ish, somewhere around there. He says, Hey, I need a ride to the comedy store. Uh-huh. There's a porn star I need to meet. Yeah, and he told me, I don't say your name. Oh, okay. I don't say your name. You said her name. I didn't say your name. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. So I thought he was kidding. I thought he was full of it. Uh-huh. And he's like, No, dude, really, I'm going to see her. You gotta, I don't have anybody to drive me. Couldn't even drive yet. I said, dude, I got to see this for myself. I knew who she was. Go to the comedy store. She's there. There's a couple of other people that are in adult cinema. They're there. Mm-hmm. We all talked. How you doing? Nice to meet you. Okay, fine. You good? Yeah. Okay, I'll see you later. I left. My job's finished. The taxi cab driver, the Uber guy is gone. I'm done. Okay. So I leave. Mm-hmm. Now, I guess he saw this woman on and off or whatever you want to call it. You know, dating, or seeing on and off, whatever, for several, for a couple months. Mm-hmm. But she stopped seeing him to start seeing Charlie Sheen. 
Oh, yeah. this is out there. This is fact. This is what went on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you're dealing with an egomaniac, narcissistic whack job who holds mm -hmm. grudges. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh my God. Yes. Jim, take it easy. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just excited to hear this because I've been saying so we, we've so got long. all these years that have gone by. You know, Aim has gone years. They're starting the book called Judy. I would like you to do something in the book. She said, no, I want nothing to do with you. It's been four years. You still haven't shut up about my son. I'd like to have peace and quiet. Let the kid rest in peace. Let me live peacefully. Enough. Talk about yourself. Well, of course, you couldn't do that. You know, I actually did something with him right before that. And I had to go over to his house and he had it on regular paper. He had the book. It wasn't even written yet. You know, it wasn't even completed yet. And I got three paragraphs in and all I see is Corey Haim, Corey Haim. And I'm thinking, if you're writing a book about you, why is the first three paragraphs Corey Haim? Don't understand it. This is who the guy is. Needs Corey Haim to sell himself. Okay. Yeah. Judy does nothing. Things get mentioned. Okay, fine. Now you go to the TV movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and they called Judy. She wanted nothing to do with him still. And he's still continuously going on. And it's like six years now. She's still going on six years, seven years, whatever it is. Wants nothing to do with with Feldman. So now he's been spurned by her twice. Mm -hmm. OK, now in 2018. A story comes out in one of the periodicals in one of the tabloids. From. Dominic Praja mm -hmm. that says Charlie Sheen did something to Corey Haim in between two trailers with a can of Crisco oil. Now, this is what is said. If anybody out there's never been on a movie set, there's normally 70 to 100 people on a movie set. Corey Haim's mother was there, father was there, or the sister was there, or two of the three at any given time. He wasn't all by himself. He wasn't alone. Now, if anything happened to him during that time, he would have said something. Uh -huh. You know, yeah, you I've, about Dominic. I've, I've seen stuff in the uh, in some of the old clips from the old uh, teeny bopper magazines that actually one of the writers actually put in there. Corey Haim is one of the most transparent ch child stars we've ever had to deal with. And that's to the media. That's not to his mother, who he told everything anyway. Right. Nothing gets said. Now, again. I play the game of being logical and sensible. Charlie Sheen's father's in the industry, uncle's in the industry, brother's in the industry. He's been on set since he was a kid. Uh -huh. Is it logical or sensible that he's going to do something to a young boy on a set outside where people could see him? Uh -huh. You know, you know, I'm, I'm going to do the the, 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 the the grabbing of the earlobe and go, hey, Corey. Come to my trailer. I want to talk to you for a minute. You close the door. Privacy. Hey, Corey, come to my hotel room after the shoot today. We got a lot of lines tomorrow. Let's rehearse. Yep. No, that's not what he did, supposedly, outside Between. of two trailers yeah. where anybody could walk by at any minute. Yeah. Charlie Jean's career is finished. It's over. Uh -huh. And he's okay. 19 years old. He's 19 years old. Had a girlfriend at the time in L.A. He's having tumbles, as they say in Yiddish, with other people around the set, extras, girls. He's got a massive crush on Kerry Green at the same time. Never did anything about it, but had a crush on her. Uh -huh. This is the guy who Dominic names – in 2017 or 18? It was 17? right when Feldman started his begging for money, which was October of 2017. There you go. Now, again, did I see them together? No, but they were friends for all those years, Feldman and Dominic. You want motive? Corey Feldman does not like Charlie Sheen. There's no question about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Did, he worked with Hain. There you go. Just put the two pieces together and the puzzle's complete. Charlie Sheen must have done something. Yeah. Corey Hain was open with me, crying 
telling me what had happened with Dominic. I clearly asked him, did anything else happen with anybody else? His answer was no. Are you sure? Yes. Nobody else did anything. No. This was repeated several times because I wanted to make sure that, you know, I was, he was spilling the beans of everything. So I would know and how to deal with it on the level that you deal with it. The chances of Charlie Sheen doing anything to a young boy at that time is zero. I'm actually going to say this because we're in a live feed and you can really say anything. Mm -hmm. The day that Charlie Sheen passes away and they get his tombstone, it's going to say actor, father, grandfather, whatever. The bottom of it, his favorite word in the English language, vagina. <laughs> so you're going to tell me that at 19 years old, this guy did this to a little boy on a set about the females and the yeah yeah you know again we're we are beyond or we're, we're way before the you know tiger blood and all the craziness yeah. and the drug. we're way before that uh -huh. yeah you know, we're decades before that now if he did which he didn't you're gonna tell me there's not one other kid that he did it to well, exactly. And all his interviews that he was doing before his documentary, he kept saying, you know, they were like, well, aren't you worried about this big name you're going to name coming after you? And he was like, oh, no, because so many other victims are going to come forward. That person's going to be busy with cases and the police. And you Hold know, on. I'm, I'm kind of putting it up, trying to find a camera. This would be zero. This would be nobody. There isn't even a girl who was 14, 15, 16 back then. Who has come forward to say he did something? Nobody has come forward. Nobody. No. Nobody has said anything about Alfie Hoffman. Nobody. He's around kids for years. Nothing. Zero. There's only one person who has started this and continuously says it, and that is Corey Feldman, and it is a load of bullshit. Uh -huh. That's where this goes. Now, I, I want to make sure that everybody who's listening and watching – I've not seen Alfie Hoffman in over 30 years. No, I've not seen him in over 30 years. Am I protecting a pedo guy because he's my best friend? No. I know it's bullshit. Uh -huh. Charlie Sheen, one hand, less than five times I have seen that man since I moved to California in 1987. Less than five times. Have I gone out to dinner with the man? No. Never gone out to a meal, have a meal with the guy. Am I protecting somebody? Am I a pedo protector? No. The only person in any of this stuff who's been a pedo protector is Corey Feldman himself knowing that his friend Dominic did something to Haim uh -huh. and, did, and did nothing about it, kept him around, and still hired him for work. Okay. Well, according to Feldman, you know, Susie, myself, Judy, Bobby – Shannon, no, no, no. everyone, Kim. we're all pedo protectors. Kim, it's it's simple. If you don't agree with him, yeah. you're a pedo protector and you're part of the wolf pack. Yeah, and you're two things. Apparently, yeah. Judy Haim has this thing. She's like Al Capone. You know, yeah. I want to call her. I call, I call her now Judy Capone because <laughs> she has everybody mesmerized. She does. Like she's she's brainwashed everybody into thinking uh -huh. that. Uh, you know, what she wants, okay? Uh -huh. There were statements made by Feldman that Charlie Sheen was paying Judy Haim yep. to keep quiet, keep silent. Judy Haim lives in a one-bedroom apartment uh -huh. with federal assistance from the, the country of Canada and the city of Toronto. Uh -huh. yep. She gets food stamps to buy food. This is not a woman with money of any kind. Right. But this is what Feldman has claimed once yeah. again. It's bullshit. Uh -huh. This is okay. Yep. Now we get to this infamous documentary. Uh -huh. the, the years of the documentary. Okay. They spent three years. One breath the other night on his live, he said they spent 1.6 million. Uh -huh. Well, if you have no locations, you're not paying the talent. Maybe you're paying the crew. But, you know, I don't know what took three years, you know, but 
That's what he said. And then about two minutes later, he says, we need people to watch it and we need people to pay for it. You must pay for it because you're cheating the producers and the talent and the crew who worked on deferred payments. They're going to get paid later. Mm-hmm. What exactly did he pay for? Exactly. I probably, could have shot, I probably could have shot what he shot for three grand, five grand. Now oh, he's yeah. going to pay, he's going to pay his director. He's going to pay an editor. He's going to pay for, okay. It costs 25 grand. Where is this 600,000 in debt that he now claims? Where is, you know, this, this is after, and now we'll get to the fun thing. He did his GoFundMe, the two GoFundMe's that grows something around 370. You're supposed to pay taxes on that money, whatever. Uh Where'd the money go? You know, where, I mean, you know, we understand he has child support, you know, he's got to still pay that. Okay. You got rent at your place. Dollars a month. Give me a break. I know people that weren't, that aren't actors that pay have to pay more in child support than that. Okay. Um, I mean, it, none of it makes any sense, but this is what he claims. This is yeah. the crying. Uh-huh. He is the absolute ultimate, ultimate feel sorry for me. Oh, yeah. He for plays the victim. Day. If yeah. there was an Emmy for a live feed on Facebook, <laughs> he would have. He would win it in a landslide. Yeah. He's Amen. amazing. Yeah. Now, and I'm just going to say this real quick. He's almost 49 years old. Mm-hmm. Whatever happened to him as a, a teenager mentally could it have affected him. Sure. Not yeah, saying it did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It didn't stop him from having relations with women, three wives, a kid. Okay. When you're 35 years into this, it's time to grow a set of nuts. Pull the bootstrap up. Grow a set of balls and stop the crying, the begging. Feel yeah. sorry for me. Yeah. Okay? I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me. Nobody. Had a good yeah. life. I've had a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay? Somebody asked me why I'm doing this. You know why I'm doing this? Why? Judy Hame, Alfie, Charlie. I come forth. I come forth. Judy's a grieving mother of 10 years who's not had peace of mind. Mm -hmm. I feel sorry for this woman. Alfie Hoffman has a daughter. She's being terrorized in college. Oh, wow. She's being, you know, people are are bullying her because of this nonsense. Wow. Wow, I didn't know Charlie Sheen, again. His kids have to read it too. His kids have to read it too. Is there any credibility to this? And again, I always play the logic and sensibility card. Uh Bill Cosby did something. Cosby show off the air before he Uh was convicted off the air. Uh Stephen Collins, seventh heaven off the air. Uh Last time I checked two and a half men is still on. Uh, Anger management is still on. Why? Uh Because these aren't creditable claims. These are claims coming from somebody who's been on drugs for over 30 years. Anybody out there who really thinks he was clean and sober for two decades, I have a bridge to sell you. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Okay. I would have my own eyes. So, yeah. You know, smoking pot, I don't care, but I know that there's other things. The girls, the angels that have left have told the stories about what went on and all that kind of stuff. You know, I feel sorry for them. Me too. You know, I really do. Me you know, I, I know that Corey is controlling, you know, when you, if you're going to be one of the girls, you move in his house. There's a list of, of things you have to do. You have to wear the angel outfit or wear lingerie or be ready to, you know, jump in the bedroom with him and whomever. And that's the way he wants to live. God bless him. I'm not here to judge. Just saying what goes on now. He is apparently an ambassador to Child USA. Yes, which looks is. out for children, keep children safe, change laws. I'm all for that. You want to help kids in Hollywood, show business, make sure that teachers and people that are going to be working with children have background checks. 
I have no problem with that whatsoever. Uh-huh. The messenger that this particular non uh, nonprofit has has hired. Uh-huh. This is the same guy who through swingers parties and other kinds of sexually related parties in his home with his three, four, five, eight year old son right down the room, uh-huh. right down the hallway. Uh-huh. Yep. In the home while he was there, nonstop. A couple, three, four times a year, whatever it was. There now, personally, I've never been to this party. I was not part of the invite because you know we haven't. He and I have not really been friends in decades. You know, a long time. I was I was alerted to this by another child star, and he told me he got an invite and he went. And the guy at the door said it's two hundred fifty bucks. Uh-huh. Oh, you want to use the bedroom? It's two hundred dollars. Oh, you want to use the cab- the the, the uh, cabana outside with a bottle of champagne? It's two hundred fifty bucks. Wow! Wow! This, this is what he's done. These are out there. It isn't a secret. Right. There's been articles done about it. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote, it wrote about these things. But this is the person that Child USA has as their guy. Uh-huh. Is that guy? No. Nope. Yeah. It's unreal and it the, doesn't the, make sense. The decades of drug use. His brain is not what it should be. His memory is not what it should be. But his imagination is really good. I got to give it to him. Yes, it is. Imagination, you know. Yeah. I'm not an. I don't. I barely drink. You know. I told a friend of mine, Riley, a couple of days ago. I told her. I said, we were we were skyping and, and having you know fun chit chat. I'm sitting in the same spot basically, and I had a, a little thing of white zin here. Here's my little thing of white zinfandel. There's my drink of choice about four to six times a year. Yeah. I, I don't have any blips on my record. I've never been arrested. I've never gone to jail. None of that stuff. I'm not a druggie, not a user, not even pot. I mean, most people now it's medical marijuana for now. Did that when I was a kid. I don't, I don't need that now. Yeah. So when people listen to him, understand who you're listening to. Exactly. Yeah. So let me ask you this um, about Marty Weiss. Did anything happen there to your knowledge? And why would he claim that it did? So so here we go. Well, when you name somebody after the fact that they get convicted of being a a pedophile, what are you what are you doing? You're just naming a name. Right. Okay. so here we go. This is the story that I got from two different people. I don't need to name them, but they were involved in, in mm-hmm. some, well, yeah, they were. Okay. I knew Marty Weiss as well. Okay. Mm-hmm. We all went out to dinner. He hung out with the gang. There was a time, I guess, way back when uh, they were at Feldman's place, the three of them. Mm-hmm. And Feldman got a call from his girlfriend at the time. Don't need to mention her, mention her name. Mm-hmm. I've known her since I was going to high school at Professional Children's School in New York. She also attended there. Okay. And she did, she did movies as well. And uh, they were on the phone. And Marty and Corey were just jerking around, making too much noise. And Feldman was like, hey, get out of here. You know, there was some another expletive that he said, whatever. Go in the room. Just get away from me so I can talk to my girl. Okay. They went in the room. The door was open. They started having a pillow fight. And Feldman came in, he's cursing him out. Hey, I told you to shut the F up. What are you doing? It's enough. What, you know, I'm on the phone. He slams the door. Apparently they thought it would be funny if they started making noises as though something had happened. Mm. Corey Haim told me this. I knew this, you know, because I, all the stuff, you know, yeah. you know, actually Marty was later, but he told me, you know, mm-hmm. And I said, so nothing happened with Marty? No. And then he told me, you know, because I knew Marty was around. And I had my inclinations that that Marty was gay. And okay, fine. I'm not here to judge. God bless. Enjoy whatever you want. Yeah. They were making some noises. Now, nothing gets said. Nothing. Zero gets said. All those years. Right. Now, all of a sudden, he's got to start naming names because he keeps saying, I'm going to name the names. Uh-huh. 
he throws Marty Weiss in there. Now, who can speak? Two people, Marty and Corey. Corey's not here. Marty's a comp- convicted pedophile. Yeah. So no matter what he says, he's guilty. Even if he says nothing happened, automatically people say you're guilty. Now, uh-huh. I've seen Marty Weiss one time since his conviction. He hadn't even gone to jail yet. And I told him I wasn't happy, and I told him how disappointed I was. I have I I can't even begin to explain how disappointed I was in the guy because he was a good guy. You don't know what goes on behind closed doors. I went to see an open secret in the theater, you know, in Beverly Hills. Went to see it at the screening that you know that they had they were going to play it for a week. This is what happened. This is what goes on. But Marty Weiss, no. What about John Grissom? Did you ever meet him? Yeah, I knew Grissom. And Corey is, Feldman has said what happened, happened. Uh-huh. Do I have anything to add to that? No, but he said it. He was involved. You know? And I, again, I don't doubt that that happened. I don't doubt that Grissom did something to him. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So do you think like his whole like Judy's running this, you know, undercover multi-million dollar operation, the Wolfpack <laughs> nonsense, is it just because it fits his narrative and he wants to be the victim and it's because Judy won't support him? Because he knows that Judy was like, yeah, Feldman's making this documentary to tell my son's story or whatever. It would have gotten 10 times more the publicity if Judy would have backed it up. So I, I personally think that's why he resents her so much. Well, of course, he spurned her twice, you know, for the book and the, the TV movie, and then the third time is the documentary. Yeah. So again, throw her under the bus with everybody else. Again, I just look at things that have gone on. I don't need to make stuff up. Yeah. This is the same kid, the same guy. Excuse me, I got something in my eye. Hmm. Oh, this is the same guy who got emancipated, throws his father down the river. My father stole all my money. We all heard it. Mm-hmm. I know Bob Feldman. I have seen Bob Feldman a couple of years ago. It was the last time I saw him. Now, this is – I'm going to go back while we were playing poker. And he was saying this stuff. All right, let's get a pad. Let's have some fun for a minute. I sat with him at his dining room table before the poker game. I started, how much did you make? And he told me 1.2 million. Okay. I'm not even going to question it. Okay. I write it down. That's what I made. There it is. I said, wait a minute. You do understand you have an uncle, right? You know, you never get to see his name is uncle Sam. He gets 30% of your money before you start. You have a cousin. You don't get to see them either. The state of California, they get another 10% of your money. So before you start off, the first 40% of your money is gone. Okay. Agents, managers, PR firms. He's paying 3500 5000 a month. Okay. We kept going. I get down to the end or what I thought was the end. It's $40,000. I said, you know, this is funny, Corey. You haven't eaten yet. You haven't gone out for one dinner. Nothing. I covered gas, the cars, what? But you come down, you haven't eaten. So you're talking about from the ages of whatever it was, four to 16 and a half, you know, those 13 years. Justice for me, victim mentality that he has. It was bullshit. Again, Bob Feldman did not steal his money. Bob Feldman, was he the perfect father? Probably not. There is no perfect father. There's no perfect person. His mother, she had her own issues. Okay. Okay. Meanwhile, Corey had lived with Bob, you know, before he got emancipated and moved out. Okay. So, again, it's the the victim card. Feel sorry for me. Have sympathy for me. Hire me. You know, and I know that different directors, you know, would put him in little little things here and there just to keep him working or to give him a few dollars in his pocket. You know, this went on for years, decades. It's what he did. He's played the victim card forever since that point. You know, um, 
why he hates Judy? It's simple. She said no to him. If you say no to him, you're hatred. You're the enemy. He's proving it as I'm speaking. People on his social media, if they don't agree with what he says, you're the wolf pack, you're the enemy, you're a pedo protector, all this stuff. I can't, I can't even make it up because that's what he does. He said the other night, oh, I blocked 300 people from my social. Why? I can tell you I might, I might have a dozen people I've ever blocked on my social media. Right. A dozen. He has well, hundreds. Something real funny real quick. So yeah. Yeah, we currently just went live on Twitter. We Instagram. have three streams, 213 people watching us right now. Mm -hmm. He has 54. <laughs> so Charlie Sheen would say, winning. <laughs> totally. You, hashtag winning. You know, what? you know what? He has the message. Okay. It's how you deliver the message. If you want to talk about childhood pedophilia and stuff that goes on in Hollywood, use yourself as the example and move it along. Right. Don't bring Corey Heyman to it. It's not necessary. You're giving an on hands detailed event. This is what happened to me because nobody checked and whatever. You know, you want to blame Bob for hiring Grissom to be his, you know, uh, uh, you know, chaperone. We're talking the 80s. You know, child pedophilia right. wasn't discussed in the 70s and 80s. No, it wasn't. wasn't. It just wasn't discussed. Was it around? Probably, sure. Again, I've never said that what he said about that is wrong. I'm sure there is. You know, you've got producers and directors, the, the casting couch. It's gone on in Hollywood for over 100 years, whether it's straight, gay, lesbian, what is gay, you know, that's on them. This is what's gone on. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying this is what's gone on. You want to clean that up? He went to the union. You guys he's, got to, he's got to start something where it's not about him. You know, uh, mm -hmm. his biggest thing is it's always about him. There, there are child, there, there are former child stood organizations out there. There's an organization mm -hmm. that exists out there. They want no part of them because it becomes the Corey Feldman show. And that's not what they want. Yep. Talk about the issues. Talk about what we need to get changed. Should everybody in Hollywood, you know, who is working with kids, who has any reason ability, you know, and it could be anybody, you know, to have a background check now. Yep. You know, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll say his name, Steven Spielberg. Does he need a background check? No, come on. It's utterly ridiculous. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a chaperone for a child, a teacher for a child, because they are one on one with a child for hours during the day when they're in school or when they're in their trailer and at night when they go back to a hotel room and they're on location. That's who needs to be checked. Yeah. I don't care if they're a father of four, a mother of six. I don't care. It's a simple thing that, you know, when they fill out their their W-2, you've got their name, their address, their social security number. Somebody needs to take that, go to the next level, whoever that is. They check it. Fine. Nothing is on the record. Everything is clean. Okay, fine. That's all you can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I still haven't finished watching the whole documentary. When it was being shown, I was running errands, and I had another interview with another YouTuber. Because I was accused, me and Shannon Marshall were accused of hacking the stream and stuff. So that was great, you know. Um, but you know, I, it's just funny because I, I need to say this because, you know, for anybody out there, uh, Susie's been accused of being this, you know, computer whiz, whatever. She was having problems with getting her phone to pick up the live feed. <laughs> all, the, all, my, all my people that are here that know, they have Yeah, them. we're all hackers. Or like in theory, like everybody's a hacker because we yeah. want to stop the message. Oh my God, this poor soul. It's the only way I can say it. This poor soul did a tweet a week or two ago, whatever it was, was talking about that his movie was the last one at the Directors Guild before mm. coronavirus. <laughs> and he's pushing his message and to make sure and watch the next go around of his documentary. 
This comes about 198,000th on the list of most important things when people are dealing with the coronavirus. The coronavirus. Yeah. He That's did what a we're live, dealing with. He as, did a as, live. A, as a world community, this is what we're dealing with. We're all in the same boat. I don't care what race, creed, color you are, what country you're from, what language you speak. That is irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Now, after it was on, he and his wife went to Jamaica to an adult mm. resort. You know what? I have no problem with that. You want to go to an adult, adult resort? Good for you. God bless. Have a blast. <laughs> My sort of problem with this was, is we were already at the quarantine point. They wanted yeah. you to stay home. They said it. It's, it's all over the globe. It's everywhere. Who would turn around and leave their home in the United States to go someplace else and possibly not be able to come home because of a pandemic. Yep. Where's the logic in any of that? There like isn't. I, said, I have no problem with him going somewhere. Now, of course, you know, he said, oh, I'm scared. They're after me, the wolf pack and all this mm-hmm. baloney bullshit. Mm-hmm. This is what he thinks. What is it, a year or two ago, whatever it was, the, you know, I was at a stoplight and somebody ran around my car and opened the door <laughs> and hit me with a syringe and oh my God, I could be poisoned. And that was us too. He goes yep. to the hospital and there's not a mark on him. They keep tiny find... Listen, a syringe is a needle. It's yep. tiny, but there's yep. going to be a mark. There's going to be even a smidgen of blood that comes from a syringe. Mm-hmm. They can't find anything. You know, mm-hmm. I was walking, he said, I was walking across the street and I almost got hit. They were after me. Mm-hmm. Was he on his phone? Was he talking to somebody? Did he look both ways? Mm-hmm. And just isn't it wild that at this particular corner that had a light, there's no video surveillance of any kind from anywhere. Nothing. Doesn't exist. Actually, at that intersection where he said he got syringed, me, Bobby, and Shannon went and drove over there when they were here. And you know, when they were here. Yeah, but, 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 but wait, Shan, uh, uh, Susie, realistically, the rest of it doesn't make any difference. Right. The point is, there's nothing. They have nothing. I was at the gas station because I talked to the guy, and he said the police were up there for two days going through all their video footage, which faces the road and zero. Zilch. Now, there is video footage, which I'm learning for the first time. I was under the estimation that there wasn't. Okay, I was wrong. I can say that. But at the same time, there's, there's nothing. So, again... There's an incident that we have nothing. We have no proof, no video, no nothing. And, of course, there's nothing on his body that says I was stabbed with a syringe. Now, I know that he's always driven Mercedes, BMW. He really likes whatever for years and years and years and decades. Now, if anybody has a BMW out there, here you go. Or any newer car, really. The second you put the car in drive, what happens? The The doors lock. Yep. Bingo. Okay. Now, if you come to a stop sign, your cars don't. Your car doesn't open up unless you put it in park. Uh-huh. Which I don't know if anybody's asking what that's kind of thing. But your car doors don't open. I don't care who yanks on the handle; it's not opening up at a light. And nobody with half a brain puts their car in park at a light. You just put your foot on the brake. That's what we do. Uh-huh. So again, we have a story. We have TMZ publicity. But we have nothing in the middle. We have no, this is what happened. This is, here's the proof. Here's the evidence. Show me something. Yeah, he never has anything. And, you know, uh, one I mean, thing I'm I, sure we talked about, sorry, is that um, I was really surprised that Susie Feldman was in that documentary. Ooh. She had Paul Judy. The documentary. So you've got Corey Feldman, his brother, his cousin, Susie. Manager Scott, Jameson, New- Jameson Newlander from Lost Boys and Keith Coogan, who was there for about 12 seconds. This is what they call Team Feldman. Uh-huh. That's his team. These are the people in this documentary. Where is anybody from Team Haim? I'm not even talking about Judy. I'm talking about any friend. You know, they didn't call me. You know, Greg, who's known in Toronto for decades, you know, 
you're friends with, with Haney? No, they don't call anybody except what's going to fit the narrative of this thing. Mm -hmm. It's Team Feldman, not anybody. The, it, team Haim, a fan of, of Haim's, a ex-girlfriend of Haim. She had plenty of girlfriends. You know, they've all spoken up one time or another, and they, they certainly could have been interviewed if somebody asked them. No, because that doesn't fit his narrative. Right. This is where we are. It's kind of, it was going to name the names and it was going to be the big Hollywood mogul and the producer into this. And, and what did you get? Zero. Nothing except the same stuff that's been said before. Mm -hmm. Well, and in the restraining orders that he attempted to get on us and that he wrote one of the detectives, he said, oh, just yesterday we interviewed the ex-fiance of this A-list celebrity that we're um, you know, outing in our movie, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it all tied up to Sheen. And I forget, we figured out who the girl was, but I can't uh -huh. remember her name. But that she wasn't nowhere in there. So I'm not sure what happened with that. Well, a lot was cut out about the wolf pack and stuff like that. So maybe that hit the editing floor too. Who knows? Well, listen, if, because, because, because. At one point, Bobby Wolf was, you know, one of the members. They called it, he, it Feldman called the Wolf Pack. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's four or five people who talk to each other. You go on social media and you bash the living shit out of him. And you know what? You know what, <laughs> Susie, Kim? Mm -hmm. That is your right as an American citizen. It is freedom of speech. You have that right to say whatever you want. People don't have to agree with it. Right. That's irrelevant. If he doesn't like it, okay, fine. Nobody has threatened him. I don't want anybody to threaten him. I don't want to go to anybody to go to his home. Nope. I don't want anybody to, to go after his kid or his wife or his ex-wife. No, I don't want any violence at all nope. to anybody in his family or himself. Neither do I would love to, I would love to meet him in a wrestling ring, no holds barred, but that's me. Yeah, that's just me. You know, well throw it out the guy from celebrity boxing, get a wrestling match, yes. me and Feldman, and we will have some fun. Yeah. And I said that very sarcastically. But don't want harm, somebody to harm him because of something I say. Don't want that at all. That is not what we're after. I want him to stop the nonsense. Stop the bullshit. Yeah. Tell the truth for maybe one time in your whole bloody life. Yeah. You know, he wouldn't know the difference between truth and fantasy if it smacked him in the head. Yeah. You know. I was just surprised Susie was in there because I knew she had called Judy and that Judy has it recorded years ago. She apologized to Judy. And, you know, she admitted that her and Corey were doing drugs on the set of the reality show and everything else and that she knew that Corey had lied about a lot of stuff and then all of a sudden she pops up in this documentary and I've heard from multiple females who lived in his home that he likes to record his sexual interaction so I truly think that he has something over that girl that lady that's his business that's their business if they are being wrongfully recorded against their will or they don't know about it that is against the law they should take that up with the district attorney's office that's what they should do other than that i can't comment on it as i wasn't there fair enough no you know this is a revealing interview this is a it's time to set the record straight Corey Hain needs to rest in peace. You know, I mean, again, I've described what happened after, you know, uh, Hain passed my feelings. This is now over 10 years and a month since Corey Hain passed away. I have not watched one second of anything that he's been in in over 10 years because it hurts too damn much. I miss that kid. I miss my little brother. I miss the smile, the laughs, the jokes. That's what I miss. And it hurt me. It hurt me for a long time, and it still does hurt me. Yeah. 
but I'm an adult. I have to put it in its place. I have to work and survive. I'm not going to turn around and sell my, my friend down the river at the expense of a grieving mother who's still grieving to this day, of course. Yeah. He has no concern, no care or love of anyone but himself. This is who he is. This is all about money. This is all a money grab. That's all that this is. Make some money. Make some money. You want to name names? Call a press conference. Name names. None of this nonsense. This is absolute insanity. And it's ludicrous that this has gone on for 10 years. I mean, the guy goes at the New York Senate on the Capitol steps and says that Cain killed himself because of his abuse. And like, yeah. no, like I was like, okay, wh- when is somebody in the media going to be like, what are you talking about? But it was just us. And then, um, what do you say this, the other day? There was no- this was 2010. This was the year of the walking pneumonia. A lot of people, you know, passed away from it. Brittany right. Murphy passed away from it. Her husband ended up passing away from it. This was not to one particular person. Or right. one incident. Feldman just flat out went out there and lied. There was also another interview he did, like the week or two before he his doc came out. And uh, Kim, you'll remember this story. He literally said that Haim had borrowed somebody's Mercedes and was yeah. so fucked up on drugs that he hit a bus of kids. Yeah. And therefore, he couldn't come into the U.S. to film the two Corys, so they had to go to Canada. Wasn't there? Never heard that story. Like that, right. Don't you, you think something like that would there'd be, been, there'd, there'd be a police report somewhere. That's you what would, I said. There'd be media on it. No, not that. Oh, them. sure. TMZ would have been there in five minutes. Somebody would have popped over because they, they got guys all over the place. Yeah. Yep. But again, nothing. There's no evidence. There's no proof. There's no nothing in the media that said this happened exactly. it's just something he came up with you know and i know he's going to come up with stuff about me he's going to make a whole bunch of stuff up just like this imaginary fight that happened between me and Hayne that never happened yeah he's gonna he's gonna make up stuff and i'm just gonna be there and i'm just gonna laugh because i know what's real and i know what's bullshit bullshit is bullshit is bullshit yeah. that's how it is I'm a Jersey boy. I say it the way that it is. Yep. That's where we are. Yeah. So, I mean, what was your thoughts on the documentary? Beside the fact that I had to stop, you know, watching it after 45 seconds. You know, I mean, I did watch it, but I was sick to my stomach, you know. But again, I I knew already, you know, uh, some of the stuff that was going to be in there. I didn't know that he was just going to trash Corey Haim and Judy, which yeah. is ridiculous. Yeah. That's your best friend. That, that's your boy. That's your guy. And you're going to trash him. Why would you do that? Why? There's nothing gained by it. You know, it's not like he's going to have a thousand more followers on social media because he's bashing Haim. That's just wrong. People love them together to do. It makes no sense. Well, right. he seems to be under the impression that, you know, we're trying to stop him from getting his message out. And it's like, no, tell your own story. Just leave Haim out of it and stop hurting Judy. That's all we've ever said. Yeah. I mean, you know, we don't know the technical difficulties of what happened, you know, the the night of the thing. Maybe the website couldn't handle the traffic. I guess there was five, eight, eight thousand people that had paid whatever. Okay, fine. You want to pay? Go for it. You know, Um, they wasted their money, but they paid. Um, but there's nobody technically savvy enough of anybody of any of the people that I have met from Bobby to Susie to Shannon, nobody, Yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. I, you know, he, he'll probably, he probably blame it on me, but I can tell you, I can't even do Photoshop. Neither I can I. Do, I can't, I don't even know the, the contents and how to work a spreadsheet. Scott, I don't upload videos because I don't even know how to edit or do that. <laughs> um, someone that I've gonna- never, I've never done a Facebook Live. I don't even know how to do it. I've no, never done it. Do I. Do you I. Know? I, I Skype. 
I pretty much I know how to open it and I know how to, to, to call somebody, you know, the little green the little green thing. Okay, that's a video, okay. And I then I know the red, out, Yeah, the I red tried button. to figure out Zoom last night with Judy and Greg and I couldn't figure it out. Yeah, well, Zoom is kind of easy because it opens up a thing. You want to join the meeting, you hit yes, and there you go. Okay, fine. Oh, but other well, than that, I got it. <laughs> I'm the furthest thing from tech savvy that there is. Yeah. You know, well, I couldn't even get that. I got, you know, I got a Samsung. I was I was a BlackBerry guy until yeah. they, until the Q10. I had the last BlackBerry, and all of my friends made fun of me. And I said, yeah. listen, I want to use this for very, very few things. Right. Take right. pictures, send email. And uh, talk and text. I don't go on websites other than if I want to Google something real quick. I don't have apps on my phone. Whatever, 7-Eleven, Carl's Jr., McDonald's. I don't go on there and go, oh, look, I'm here. I don't do that. It's just not who I am. You know? Yeah, see, I was hoping this was all going to come to an end after his documentary. Like, okay, he told this thing, it's done and over with. But then he comes up with this whole thing, says there's hackers. And he didn't talk about the Wolfpack. Rarely ever did he ever tweet about us. He definitely, I, I know he mentioned Kim once in a video, but he wouldn't mention us. And um, now he can. So. This last week, it's Wolfpack this, Susie this, Kim this. Kim not, yeah. But you're, again, you're the enemy. So you're, you're riling people up. We're discussing these things. He's not going to be happy about them because mm -hmm. it's actually what happened. So, I mean, I actually put a thing on the truth. This has been the truth. This is not a load of bullshit made up stories. This is what this is. You know, I was there. This is what happened. He's bringing you in because it creates another tweet, another something, somebody else to maybe follow him. That's why yep. I feel like he was doing it for publicity because then guess what? Always. Then he says, oh, I'm selling tickets again to my movie. And then just like how he said, I had the black 250 Wolfpack members. Like, <laughs> what? But name five of us, you know? You know? But, no, like but anybody who doesn't adhere to his agenda – and what he says, you're the enemy. You're the pet pedo protector. You're this and you're that. Yeah. That's how he is. This is this is a very mentally unstable human being. And I honestly, feel sorry for the guy that this is where he is now. Yeah. But he's doing it on the on the on the ass of Corey Hain. That's how he's making his money. Yeah. You want to do something, do something for nothing. Put yourself out there. I do Special Olympics. I do other stuff for kids. I've got a, a, a police officers, you know, they ask me for stuff. I send them stuff for free to, to you know, for their charitable functions. A friend of mine in D.C. works with, you know, uh, wounded warriors. Send them stuff two, three times a year, whatever he, he wants. Four pictures, ten pictures. doesn't make any difference. It's giving of oneself. That for for to help somebody else this is not him this is not what he does it's always about him yeah and Hain because he's got to sell the package you know somebody on Twitter said something yesterday along the lines of you know too bad Feldman's legacy couldn't have been his movies as a young child and you know his younger years but now his legacy that he's leaving behind everybody else is him crying on a freaking Twitter live. That's, that's one it. person. Listen, that's social media. That's one person's opinion. Yeah. But again, don't belittle the guy. Had a hell know. of a track. Had a it, hell of a run. True. He did have a good you know, career. You know, Friday the third, Friday the, listen, Friday the 13th, four is great. Gremlins, great. But he's a smaller role in that. But okay, fine. And he's got Goonies and he's got license to drive and. Uh -huh. You know, Lost Boys is fantastic, you know. So he's got those things, and I don't belittle yeah. them. Good no, for him, yeah. you know. Now, realistically, this stuff is going to come and pass into the video of this. People are still going to see the movies for decades and decades, and generations will pass it down, and they'll still enjoy it, which is great. Have a fan base. Have people that care about you. They want to come and see you at a show, meet you, take a picture, get an autograph. That's great stuff. We are a few of the very, very lucky. That's what we are. You know, we, we have to understand who we are and what we're about. He doesn't do that. No. To him, it's still 1987. He's still 
the mega star. He's still doing the Michael Jackson nonsense, you know, which I know all about the fight with him and Michael. It was his fault. It was, it was Feldman's fault. He created it. He caused it. And that caused the, uh, you know, it was a couple phone calls made and that was the end of their friendship. You know, that's pretty much all I want to say about that. But it was, it was Feldman's fault and he couldn't take responsibility for himself. He never took responsibility. It's just like his movie doing so bad. Like it's all the Wolfpack's fault and oh, people care about exotic and tiger, whatever it's called. And they don't care about me, me, me. Well, 20 year old kids, 30 year old kids don't know who you are to begin with. And, you know, you put it on a website and made it difficult for people that are in the age group that grew up watching him. It's hard for them to figure out. You know, my dad couldn't figure out how to watch his movie if I, he wanted to watch it. My dad wouldn't be able to figure it out. Um, you know, Listen, again, you know, the work that he did is there. It's fine. You know, if you don't continue to work as an actor on a regular basis, you find something else to do, whatever that is. You want to produce, you want to write, you want to be a crew guy, be a tech, whatever it is, you know, but it takes somebody, it takes somebody to put their ego to the side. Could he ever be a production assistant? Could he ever be a second PA or an AD, you know, or something? No, because it's always about him. You know, I was taught, I had a teacher. I was extremely, extremely lucky. I got maybe the best teacher on planet earth and his name was Richard Pryor. This man told me everything. Any question I had, he told me we were sitting in his house. This was right at probably early 88. And uh, I was asking him, I said, you know, you have no ego. I'm amazed. You know, you're so open to people and friendly and whatever. He goes, how much does ego pay? Is that going to help me pay for my car, my house, put food on my table? I said, no, no, it's, it's a mind thing. He says, oh, no, no, I know what it is, but it's a waste of time. It's a total waste of time. There's my teacher, the best teacher I could possibly have ever asked for. Mm-hmm. Feldman didn't have that. It was me, 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 me. Yeah. That's who he is. That's what he does, how he runs the show, how he runs his life, you know. I mean, there were times, 2007, he called me up. Hey, you know, I, I need some bread, man. I got to pay rent and I got, to, you know, child support. And I said, let me see if I can work on something. And one of the trading card companies that I dealt with, I was doing a series with them. And sure, get Corey Feldman. Absolutely. Great. So I put some money in his pocket, paid his rent, helped with child support. Okay, fine. You know, he was promoting the book that I can't stand, but he was going to be going to New York to do good morning America. And there was a show in New Jersey there the weekend before he was doing good morning America on a Monday. And he said, Hey, I'm, I'm, I can make my flight arrangements. I can get there on Friday for the show. Would you let me come? I said, it's not to me. It's up to the promoter. Promoter did not want him at all. He didn't want to have anything to do with him. But I said, listen, he needs, you know, rent money. He needs child support money. You got to have a heart, you know, and this is like five, six years ago. And even though I didn't really talk to him and even though whatever, he asked me for a favor for child support. I'm not going to take it out on his, on his son, the kind of person that he is. Mm-hmm. Okay, fine. He does the show every day. He's an hour late, an hour and a half late. It's complaining. It's this. He needed somebody extra to be with him. And his manager, Scott, came with him. I had the captain of the police department there in the room with him for security. Didn't need anybody, but that's him. This is what he needs. It's all about him. And he pissed off fans because he was so late, you know. And there were other things that went on. I'm sorry, say again? Is that when Courtney got stuck at the border? Yes. Okay. And he wasn't even there the full weekend, but he expected to get paid for the full weekend? No, 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 no. He was there. You know, he he was there, you know. Uh, he was there Friday, Saturday, and some Sunday. No, he was there. He was just late every day. You know, you got you got people waiting in line to meet you. There's your fans, and you can't show up on time. Nope. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah, the chat, the you're willing to take questions from the chat. Sure, go for it. 
All right, I have two chats going up, so I'm going to try to watch. If you see one on the chat you're watching, just go ahead and read it. I know Dishwasher Blonde, she had a, she wanted to ask one of questions. Okay. So I'm just waiting for her to type it. They're on a little, they're like on a 25 second delay. Okay. Go for it, you know. Uh, this can be like the Dr. Oz show that I didn't do because they didn't want me on it because I wasn't going to agree with what Feldman said. Uh, there you go. Greg, I asked him about that story before he, we went live and he said he's not going to tell it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're denied, Greg Harrison. <laughs> How can I get How can I get my A time to live VHS signed by Scott? A time to live. Oh, a time to live. Yeah, I don't know who it is, but they got to kind of catch me <clears throat> at an appearance somewhere. You know, I don't, uh, I don't do the autograph thing in the mail. You know, I don't do that. People have got my address; they send me stuff, and you know, I just, I don't do that. Um, and I don't have a website where people could come and buy my stuff and autographs. Again, yeah, I'm not tech savvy, and that's just not what I've ever done. Okay, Dishwasher Blonde says, if Feldman falsely accused Alfie, what do you think about him hinting that Bobby Hoffman was inappropriate to kids? Uh, from everything that I have heard from, from Alfie and others, nobody ever saw anything. Okay. I was told Bobby was a good father. Now, there's this misconception here. Bobby, Bobby Hoffman is Alfie Hoffman's father. That is correct. Okay. Bobby got together with a, with a woman. They had a child together. She didn't want to take care of the child for whatever reason. Bobby f took full custody and took care of his son. And from what I've un to be understood, Alfie has had no complaints about the way that his father treated him. He was a good father. Yeah. So, you know, again, uh, I don't ever say, is it impossible? No. What I've, have I ever heard anything remotely close? No, not until Feldman brought this up. Nobody else has ever said that. Is anything possible? Yes, but I have not heard anything to that effect. So I, I can't uh, say 100%, but 99% because nobody's ever said anything. Again, these instances don't happen once. If somebody does something to somebody, they do it more than once. They don't stop. Uh-huh. I had somebody else up here that had a question, but okay. Did Corey Feldman have a real relationship with Ginger Al, or was it sexual abuse like he claimed, like he now claims? Well, I laid out the situation for you. Yeah. I took the guy to the comedy store more than willing because he's the one who called me to tell me he's got to meet up with her. Now, at the time, he's, I want to say 16, right around 16. He wasn't driving yet. Okay. Now, at 16 and you've hit puberty, if, if it's a woman, period, and, and you're a heterosexual male, you're going to go for it. And we're not exactly talking about an unattractive woman here. This was – she was in her prime. This is a extremely beautiful woman. If they went back to her place – and something went down and they had relations. Okay. Yeah. So now if somebody wants to say, oh, was it molestation? Oh, it must have been the six or seven or eight or ten other times he went over there and did it. You know, that's not molestation. That's not the, the definition of it at all. Uh -huh. Was she older? Yeah. He was on top. He was a star at that time. You know, you're talking, you know, 87. He was a, he was a macher, as they say. It was a big wig. She wanted to be with him. He wanted to be with her. You go for it. You know, I actually told that story on Howard Stern in 1992. I told that story in 1992, and he confirmed it. But then he said, no, I don't want to talk about that, Howard. Let's talk about my record, my song. <laughs> and that, that lasted about 20 seconds, and Howard had enough of that. Yeah. But I told the story. He didn't say right then and there, hey, dude, that's not what happened. This is what happened. No, it didn't. You know why? Because that's what happened. 
I say it the way it happened. This is what it is. Uh, uh, sorry, someone, Christina told me to ask somebody's question, but I don't see it. I was asking them to ask it again. I don't think they have. I just want to make sure. Uh, Corey then told everyone who'd listen that MJ abandoned him in New York City during 9-11. He said this for many years. Um, someone, Lewis. Ask a good question. What was your favorite thing about Corey Haim? His smile, his laugh, his jokes, his hugs, kisses on the cheek. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. and he loved my cooking. Almost nobody likes my cooking. He liked my cooking. <laughs> you know, I made him. I made him pasta, so he liked that. Um, the the previous comment, yes, that's when the fight started. The argument was 9-11. Everybody was in New York. It happened. The Jackson family was getting back on the plane, and Corey was nowhere to be found, and he was left in New York. But that was his own doing because he couldn't be found. Okay, here's the question. Can you ask Scott if he knows Will Wheaton, who said Feldman bullied him on a set of Stand By Me? I, I, I know Will. Never said that to me. Okay. But if Will said it, I would probably take it for what it is. Will's a pretty stand-up dude, you know. Yeah. Met him many times over the years. Good guy. Uh, please repeat what Corey Feldman did to Judy after he passed away. We've gone over that. Someone says, no question, Scott. Just thank you for doing this. I met you at Alfie's years ago. You're a good guy then and now. Thank you. Whoever that is, I say thank you as well. Their name is CC007. Um, was Feldman and Haim really friends? Could it be just business arrangements? Exactly what it was. We sort, we sort of covered that. You know, it, it was it was business past, you know, the beginnings of 1990. It was just business, you know. You know, in order to be friends with somebody, you got to reach out to them on a semi-regular basis. You go to dinner with them. I got a friend of mine, Craig, okay? All during this thing, we were separated. It was killing both of us because we love to go to Sioux Plantation. We go out to dinner at least once a week, you know? Now, I actually went out of my house the other night and went and saw him, and, you know? We had some pasta with me, him, and his wife. Um, but that's what friends do. Right. They weren't friends. This, yeah. this... Feldman agenda push. He was my best friend. That's if that was his best friend, I really feel sorry for the guy because he right. almost never talked to him and didn't see him unless it was something work related. Yeah. Okay. This is from Dishwasher Blonde. What did you make of Feldman's first marriage? Vanessa Marcel now says it was a joke they played on Friends. Um. Didn't really get to know her at all back then you know that uh you know I, I i can't even say i can comment on it because if i was i'd just be making up shit and i just don't do that you know i mean sort of the proof is there you know once she got uh i think she got general hospital and then she got another job of some kind and she broke it off with him why i couldn't tell you I've never sat down and asked either one of them why that happened. If Dominic Brasha were still alive, do you think he would have fought the allegations? Damn good question. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. I don't even know if Feldman would have named him had he not passed away. Exactly. I was Probably say that. not. Because <laughs> yeah. if you're friends with somebody for a couple of decades, you know, they, they're your friend. Now, again, you know, even knowing that Dominic did something to Haim, Feldman was still friends with the guy. That alone is sad. That alone is disturbing. Yeah. You know? Okay, Maximus Prime, I just want to know about the rest of the Soda Club clique. Like Scott Grimes, Alfonso, whatever. Ribeiro. Horrible. Yeah. Um, Mackenzie Aston. Yeah. Ricky Roder, Robin Lively, Lively, do they do they have anything to say? If they have anything to say, they are more than welcome to speak up for themselves. Right. Scott Grimes is his own man. 
Mackenzie's his own man. Didn't you, Tom? Todd, wait, Todd Bridges is his own man. Yeah. You know, uh, Alyssa was there. Um, nobody would have touched her anyway. Nobody would have gone near Alyssa because they knew they would have had to answer to Tony Danza. And nobody was going to do that. So nobody did that. Um, oh, God. I mean, Alfonso, he's his own man. You know, I'm not going to put words in other people's mouths. Good. I'll say this, though. Not one of those people. Let me think. Nope, I can't even say that. One of them has reached out to me about all of this, of the old crew. One has reached out to me. I won't say who it was, but they have reached out to me. And they just can't believe that he's gone to the place, that Feldman has gone to the places he's gone. You know, this was a extremely fun time. Christina Applegate, David Faustino, Alfonso singing and dancing. I've said this, I'll say it again. Live feed, Alfonso Ribeiro, the most talented kid of that generation. Good singer, dancer, actor, funny. Wasn't anything that Alfonso couldn't do. Wow. You know, um, Schroeder, I, you know, Schroeder's his own man. He's got, you know, married, divorced, kids, whatever. I'm not going to put any words in any of their mouths. If, if some of them see this, you want to step up to the plate, you want to comment, feel free. I'm all for it. Us too. So what was the story with Harold Pruett, Pruett P-R-U-E-T-T? -T? He passed away, but Feldman mentioned his name in the book as a possible victim. I don't know that I met the man. I couldn't remember. That's not a name that rolls off my tongue or in my brain at all. You know, there was a photographer I know that had some issues and had problems later on, pedophilia stuff. You know, Marty, we've already, you know, mentioned. Um, Vel Velarde, something, Vel Velard, Bob, Bob Velard. Velard. I think, yeah. I think yeah. he was one of them, you know, but he went to jail, you know. Yeah. John Grissom can't be found. He's in Mexico or someplace else, you know. You know, but there's, there's no, first of all, there is a statute of limitations as far as the law goes that you can only go back now. I think until I think you can go back as far as 2017 or no, you can go back seven years, 2013. So we can't go back to 1986, 87, 85. You can't do that now, but they've done though, I guess they changed the law. So from here on out, if something happened to you 30 years, it's 2055 and something happened to you in 2020 and it's been 35 years, you can still do something to that person. I believe that's how the law was changed. You know, so the police, the FBI, the CIA, well, no, they're not going to waste man hours on something that is far past the statute of limitations. Right. And it's hearsay coming from a person whose track record is filled with hearsay and bullshit. <laughs> yep. Um, somebody asked what you thought of Susie Feldman. Nice girl. Yeah. Always got along with her. Yes. Always got along with Susie. You know, you know, I, I, I know the issues that led to them splitting. And it was a lot of it was most all was Feldman's ego was Corey Feldman's ego, not Susie. Mm -hmm. um, Susie was a good woman. She was a good mom. You know, there are things that she let happen because Corey ran the show. He was yeah. the boss, you know. So, I mean, in its own way, you could say she got bullied into things. That might not be the right word, but, you know, I always found Susie to be nice and sweet. Now, I understand that, you know, she's no princess like anybody else. She's on Team Feldman. We get it, you know. But the, the times that I spoke with her was at their, at their home during the poker games, whatever. She was always very nice. Nothing, nothing bad to say about it at all. Yeah. Um, can you ask Scott what is the most valuable baseball card he has ever owned, and which one is his favorite, but not necessarily the most valuable? Thanks. Um, I had a '53 Bowman color Ted Williams that was in pretty decent shape, and it was probably worth about three grand at the time, something like that. Um. But uh, 
my favorite baseball card. Man, that's tough. Um, I like the old Toys R Us sets that they used to make, and they used to put them out in the stores, little box sets. Yeah, and I, those ones. No, no, they were just the regular two and a half by three. They just they were like a deck of cards, but they were baseball cards. I used to have um, like white ones. Yeah, no, the Toys R Us, and uh, I have a couple of the Barry Bonds's. You know, who's the friend? And I, as a baseball player, is amazing. So what they call PSA ten, it's graded at ten, all of that. And then the other card that I have in my desk is uh, I have a George Steinbrenner, what they call a cut card. It's a, his autograph that was cut off out of a book, and they put it onto a baseball card. Oh, wow. That's that's the favorite card that I have. Yeah, I could say Thurman Munson rookie and, you know, whatever, but those are the couple, you know. Um, someone else says, what does Scott think of Feldman using Matt Lauer's indiscretions to discredit being challenged? It's just another excuse, in my opinion. There's an old saying. If you live in a glass house, do not throw stones. Yeah. There it is. Matt Lauer, guilty, not guilty. That's not my judgment to make. He, 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 you know, people said this, people said that. Okay. But for Corey to jump on somebody else, it's joining the bandwagon. That's basically what that is. Yeah. Jenny, Jenny Abel says, why did you stop acting? You're, you are a fantastic actor. I just saw you in the toy and we love a Christmas story. No, thank you. I have never stopped acting. In fact, I just did a film between uh, right after Christmas up through the first week in January. I did a film, an independent uh, back in New Jersey and New York. So I still do act. I'm still out there. If somebody wants to hire me, Screen Actors Guild has my contact information and I'm out there. You know, unfortunately, due to I don't live that close to L.A., you know, or the studios, be it, you know, right. Burbank or Culver City. Um and it costs, it's a lot of time and money getting the car to go to auditions and so forth. And I would spend three, four hours in the car for an audition, you know, so I'm not a part of the audition process. I don't have anybody representing me. You know, I do my own negotiations. I have a lawyer that looks at my contracts. Okay, fine. Somebody wants to hire me, find me. I'm not impossible. Oh, there was, there's another thing that, that, that I just, I just kind of kicked, kicked into my head. I've lived in the same home for over 13 years. I've had the same phone number for, oh my God, probably close to 20 years. Never gotten a phone call about anything from that side of the fence for a documentary, for a book, nothing. I was never contacted. Now you guys were taken to court, right? The, 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 the restraining order. That he didn't show up. My, somewhere in there, apparently my name was on something. Now I wasn't served. It was, it was. I have, I have it all scanned. I can email it. Yeah, somewhere you. on there, my name was mentioned for whatever the reason. Yeah, I don't remember exactly what the reason for. I think they. But I'm not, I'm not hard to find. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me at shows. I don't hide. I'm not in hiding. You know, so. They could find me if I was mentioned in that that restraining order thing, which I was shown that I was, which is hilarious. But there it is. Uh, Allison eight one two nine says Richard Pryor seemed like such an amazing, interesting guy. Did you happen to see him before he passed? And I know you. Guys I I was friends with I was friends with Richard from the day I met him until the day he passed. I hung out with him many times. We did dinners, lunches. We went out. We went to other movie sets. Um, I saw him about two and a half months before he passed was the last time uh, they had a function at the AFI that I went to with him. They did a tribute thing at the comedy store that I went up and spoke about him. He was by far the most amazing human being I've ever met. Period. Yeah, There's, there was nobody in comparison to the kindness. The I had all of his phone numbers, you know. And I would call him for different things, you know, and um, not once did I ever get, hey, kid, I'm busy. I can't talk to you right now. Never happened. 
never happened because that wasn't Richard. He was just a great guy. Quick story in all of this. Uh, he was coming to Radio City Music Hall. I called his office. They got. They asked him whatever. They, he said, Scott, he can have whatever he wants. So I ended up with four tickets. I took a date, me, my mom, and my dad. We went to see him backstage afterwards. Ended up in the little, the ultimate VIP room with like 12 other people. Richard came out wearing a, a robe, his RP robe on the lapel. Looked around the room. Had not seen us in over a year since we had finished the movie. Walked over, gave my father a hug. Danny, how are you? Gave my father a hug and a kiss. Said to my mom, Sharon, it is so wonderful to see you. How are you? Gave my mom a hug and a kiss. Introduced himself to my date. Gave her a hug and a kiss on the cheek. And he said, all right, come here, you. And he picked me up and he gave me a big bear hug. We stayed for several hours. He's like, you don't have to leave. Go get some food. Get a cup of coffee. You want to have a drink, whatever. I wasn't old enough to drink, but, you know. Um, but that's how he was. One of the greatest human beings I've ever met. Yeah. Everybody should want to be that Richard, not the pre before he burned himself up and all of that, but the one after who wanted to educate, talk to people, be kind, be nice. You know, we played video games and, you know, we went to amusement parks and the movies. This is what I did with the guy. Was he after me sexually? No. Not even in the vicinity. He used to send girls to my trailer when we were shooting the movie, you know, and I would tell him about it. He would laugh, you know, and then years later, uh, we were, I'm at his house and the last American version came on the TV and I started laughing. I said, I remember those days we were shooting the movie, you know, all those girls were coming to my trailer and he goes, what'd you think? You were stud muffin. You think you were this all, you know, bulked out guy? No, he goes, I was sending him to your trailer, dude. I had the greatest wingman ever. <laughs> That's Richard Pryor. Aww. All right. Well, Greg and Coleslaw Wolf and Dishwasher Blonde just sent uh, or shared the link for Hames Art because I saw some people asking if there was any personal items of Corey Hames for sale. And I know Judy doesn't. Is not getting rid of what she has, you know. No, no, I believe they do make. There. I think they make prints of it or something like that. Whatever it is, you know. Yep. Otherwise, I would suggest like looking on eBay because maybe somebody got something of his, you know, ten years ago when he passed, and they're looking to sell it now. But it's possible, you know. They they could. It could be out there. Thank you for coming on here and saying how much they love you and thank you for doing this. Thank you, whoever watched this. Please share the link. Spread the word. Today is the 21st of April. Tomorrow is, you know, let's get some more money day. So let's, you know, yes. you know, you know, it kind of it is what it is. At this point, if you want to still pay 20 bucks, God bless you. Here's the thing. Should we take bets right now? Do you think he's going to have a smooth sale tomorrow with this movie? Or do you think something's going to happen again when he goes? Don't know. Life? Don't know and don't care. I know. I don't just, care. Hey, Scott, okay? <laughs> you know. I, I, mean, I don't know. You know, all, all of this, again, I'm going to say it again for those that kind of turned in late or whatever. I didn't do this for me. I did this for Judy. Alfie and Charlie, their lives are being screwed with messed up because you have got a very, very mentally disturbed person throwing them down the river for nothing for his own personal gain. Yeah. Taking off my glasses. I didn't ask for money for this. I don't want any money for this. It's not what I do this for. It's not what I did this for. It's to get the truth out there, what the hell happened, what went on, and how it went on, and what's bullshit. I love that word. It's such a great word. Great it is word. a great word. Bullshit. Yeah. Okay. You know. Huh. Or is it or Mel Brooks in History of the World said, bullshit, 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 and bullshit. <laughs> Are you serious, Casey? Hmm? What? Feldman's live on Instagram now. I guess he did his Twitter live, and now he's on Instagram. God bless him. 
Yeah. Let yeah. him have fun. We got nothing else to do. Listen, everybody stay healthy. I almost forgot that part of this. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the middle of this thing. Wear your mask. Do the social distancing. Stay safe. Because yeah. the longer this thing goes with people getting sick is the longer we're all home. And none of us want to stay here. No. No, no, no. All right, Scott. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Is there anything else that you wanted to say or... I don't I don't really think that there was much else that that could be said, you know, well, I think I, I think I heard it, you know, from top to bottom. And, um, you know, listen, we, we we all pay a price in life and there's things called karma. OK, and I believe in karma. That's what I believe. Yeah. Karma is out there. So yeah. it's who does the right things, who does the wrong things who's out for themselves to enrich themselves and who's not. Right. That's where this is. When I got something to say that I'm, I'm pushing a book or whatever, a movie, whatever, that's what I'm going to tell you I'm doing. Right. I'm not going to sugarcoat it with sympathy and crying and all that nonsense. You mean, you know, you book and it doesn't do good in sales you won't go oh they care more about joe exotic than me Thank you. you know i didn't even know who the guy was until it ended up on tv and then tmz about 800 times i had no idea who the guy was <laughs> I still you know don't, i don't I haven't watched it. i don't I, I don't watch very much of reality television you know uh, the 90 day fiance thing or whatever the hell that show is called. I watch that because it's funny. Me too. I love it. You know, you know, my, <laughs> you know, but I mean, I got a friend of mine, Dan back in New Jersey. He loves the pimple popper thing. Ew. No. And the bo botched with all the surgeries that have gone bad. You know, they watch that stuff. I don't, I don't watch it at home. If I'm at his place, then I happen to watch it, you know, cause I'll watch it. Yeah. I did. Somebody asked earlier, but I, you were in the middle of talking, and then it moved up too far. Somebody had asked something about like how you how you feel like TV has changed or something along those lines. No, it's a horror show. Yeah. There are good programs, you know. I do like the Blacklist. If I happen to be home, I watch it. Whatever. I still watch the older stuff, you know. I love Seinfeld. You know, Soup Nazi Larry Thomas, God bless him, phenomenal. Um, I mean, the whole cast was Seinfeld was great. I watched Married with Children. You know, if I'm laying in bed at night and I click it and it comes on. But the new stuff, you know, they're not stars. Right. They're celebrities. They're press driven because they're on these shows. Most of them don't have any talent. You know, they're not actors. You know, they just happen to be the five stupidest people to walk in the room that they put together to make a show. You know, um, the, the talent shows, American Idol, The Voice, these, there's some great people up there. You know, was it so I know how to dance or the name of that show? Awesome. You know, um, um, The Globe, The Celebrities, The Globe. What is it? Um, the Celebrities at the uh, 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 America, not America's Got Talent. The, the, the concert thing they just did? Well, they've done it for 20 years. What's The Globe thing? The, the, Academy the Awards? No, 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 no. Where they dance. They get up and they dance every week. Oh, so you think you can dance? America's no. Got Talent? No, the, the celebrity one. Oh, the mass Singer? No. That's no. actually kind of fun. I don't watch it all the time, but I'll watch the clips of it later on. The no, no. The, um, out of here. <laughs> oh, Alfonso I know. The, I know Alfonso the show you mean. One. I can't think of the name, though. You yeah, this shows you... I'm this shows you how much I love these shows. I can't even think of them, you know. There I am. Um, but they're not real. Stars. Hmm. Dancing with the stars. Yeah. Bingo. Dancing gotcha. with the stars. I said dancing and stars. I just didn't put it together. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know they're fun to watch. You know, but then most of the reality stuff is just whatever. You know, mm -hmm. uh, storage wars. I know it's scripted. Oh, yeah. it's, you know, it's hysterical. You know, I like yeah. Barry. He was, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um. And um, you know, yep, that guy Darryl, is funny. Daryl C. Uh, Daryl, yep. Daryl's fun, you know, yeah. but that's not the yep guy, whatever. He's fun. <laughs> I don't watch oh, him on a regular yeah. basis. If, I, if there's nothing else on, you know, I will watch it. 
you know, if Blazing Saddle is on or Abigail Salome Frankenstein or the Ten Commandments or Fra- uh, 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 um, Frasier I liked back in the day, Sopranos I liked back in the day, any of that stuff is on, I'll watch that stuff first. Yeah. I think we're all watching a lot of TV lately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I asked you if you had anything to say, Scott. I'm going to say this, and this is my final thought, and then, Kim, you can go. As long as Feldman is still speaking Judy's name, I'm not stopping, Corey, because you need to let Judy grieve her son and live the rest of her life out without your shenanigans and your bullshit. Bottom line, say you're for the kids. What about Judy's grandkids that have to read all this crap that you put out there about her son? Why don't you about that? Yep. So, listen, I'm going to do some of these podcasts and some of these things to kind of, you know, just get the message and what reality really is and what the truth is. You know, it's my truth. You want to call this my truth? You can call it. But I was there. I know what went on. You know, I'm the logical one and the older one of all those guys. I was the older brother that everybody came to for advice and looked up to, and I need a ride, and I need this, and okay, fine. That's who I was. That's where it was. That's how it happened. End of story. If he wants to keep pushing his nonsense and bullshit, that's up to him. But this is now out there. It'll be shared. People will start talking about it. Not because I want to be something great and wonderful. Not because I need the attention. That's not what this is about. You want to be there's, on my There's that. two people who could tell this story. Me and Judy Haim, and that's it. We're the only two people who were really there. Did he have other friends? Yes, of course. You know, were they as close? That I couldn't tell you. When I hung out with Haim, I hung out with Haim. Right. You know. So, you know, I, I, I absolutely adore that woman. She deserves none of the last 10 years that she's gotten. She was a good mom, still a good mom, good grandma. You know, know. and for people in the chat, just so people don't know this, I did not get involved with this for because of Haim or because of Judy or nothing. It was because of my experience that I had with Feldman when I met him three times years ago. And it triggered me that he was asking for money to name pedophiles. And I made a tweet reminding him who I was and what I knew about him and that he was a scammer and a drug user. And I instantly got blocked. A couple of his Feld fan members, I think Kim was one of them at the time, or somebody came at me and, you know, were like, oh, yeah, right, blah, blah, blah. And then Shannon Marshall and this other girl, Shannon, show up on my tweet and they're like, oh, tell us more. You know, (laughs) I was like. Well, this is, you know, what happened when I met him. And then I, like, I had no idea. I did not follow him. I had no idea he had written a book. I knew in 2000, 2001, he had a band with guys. That's the last I knew. Like, I didn't know he did wife swap. I knew nothing. And then I just started finding out more of this stuff. And then I found out about the bandmates. And I was just like, oh, my God, this guy is such a scammer. Like, I, I knew it 20 years ago, 17 years ago. And so I got into it because of that in October of 2017. And then when Feld, a Feld fan member that runs his website sent CPS to my house under false allegations, which Corey gave her the stamp approval on it because I shared screenshots that she talked to Shannon and I because she was lying. So that's what I got in return. And then that's when Bobby had said, because I was on the phone with Bobby when they showed up. And then he told Judy. And then Judy and I started talking in April of 2018. So I didn't get involved with this because of Judy. But now I've gotten to know her so well. We talk on the phone every day. And she's a great person. She's an honest person. She's not a bullshitter. She's she's not like, you don't get one ounce of that from Judy at all. No, you're right. I, you know, that's again. Actually- Corey, everybody says Corey Haim like told, you know, his whole st- stuff and put it all out there. I think that Corey learned that from his mom. Absolutely. Because uh-huh. she's no hold bars either. You ask her something, she'll answer you. And then yeah. something private and then she's going to tell you, I don't, you know, but. Listen no. again, you, the, something we didn't say, and it's kind of, it is what it is. I have always had a belief. I've always believed that Feldman was jealous of Hain. Not for what you think, though. Not for talent, 
not for being blonde against the brunette. I really think the beginnings of it all was the fact that Haim had a good relationship with his mother and his father. Had a good relationship with them. It was very solid. And Feldman didn't feel that he had that relationship with his. Mm-hmm. You know, I think him and Bob, they probably bashed heads a bunch of times. And his mother had her issues. You know, there were things involved, you know, and he's spoken about that. You know, so I think the jealousy part of it, the whys and how comes it started way back, you know, but Judy has never been shown me anything but being a great, caring, loving mother. You know, I, I, I remember, I can tell you one time they were in an apartment um, and Judy had smoked a fatty. She had a blunt, you know, one time. <laughs> and we're talking like, this is like 90, inhale. <laughs> 93, 93, something around there. I was in eighth grade. <laughs> Since that time, I've never seen the woman do anything. She's not a druggie. She's not an alcoholic. You know, she knew I was coming on this show. She was going to be watching it, whatever. I told her, sit back with a glass of wine. You know, she says, I don't drink. Yeah. So then I, I, said, oh. I said, make it a cup of tea. You know, that's it. So, I mean, when people are questioning uh, other parents that they don't spend a lot of time with, they have no business questioning them. My mother is fucking awesome. Excuse my French, but she is. That's just my mom. Okay. My dad, that's another story I don't need to discuss right now. It is what that is. But um, Judy is just a great lady. She's a good hearted woman. You know, so, you know, I think that, you know, realistically, that is the best place to leave this at is just telling people what a great person Judy was. And we've laid all out the rest about that other guy. Yeah, exactly. So we'll leave on that note. I know people are asking me to restream his live. I am going to end this because I am not putting him on the same video as this interview. So no. want i can um i'll turn this off and i can start another one i can do it on this channel and uh we can restream it no thank you thank you for the time Susie. thank Thank you for the friend kim i appreciate it and let's just hope that the word spreads on what reality truly is yeah Yeah, maybe when quarantine's over i can come meet you for lunch or something and we can there we go well thank you for your time thank you you. you, everybody got it Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. You too. Bye.